Hi everyone, I'm Becca Gerald. I'm the worship director here at Countryside in Sandusky, Michigan. The message you are about to hear has been previously recorded, but we would love to have you stop in and check out one of our 10 a.m. Sunday services or watch our services online on Facebook or YouTube. Thank you for listening. God bless. Please open your Bibles with me to Matthew chapter 21. And when you've done that, somehow I want to get your attention, either eyes up here, your focus, you know, just back this direction. But I want you to be open to Matthew 21. But then I want to have everybody's attention because I'd like you, please, to close your eyes for just a moment as you consider your answer to this question. Who do you think? Go ahead, close your eyes. OK, here we go. Here's the question. Who do you think of when I say the words, the king? Okay, you can open your eyes now. Okay, now I know that since we're sitting here in church, Sunday school answer is Jesus or God or something along those lines. And, and that's okay. That's totally okay. That's understandable. And, and I appreciate it. All right. But by a show of hands, how many of you also thought maybe of Elvis? Anybody think of Elvis? Okay. Yeah, some of us. Or how about maybe, maybe, maybe even King Charles? Okay, we got a king overseas now, right? There's a king over there. Um, or maybe one of these other 30 individuals listed in Wikipedia's list of people, mostly artists or athletes who have gone by that nickname. All right, so there's a lot of people. I'm trying to get a pointer here, see if I can show you some of these. There we go. Um, so a lot of people who have gone by that nickname. I'm only going to point out a few over here in the United States, all right? But how many of you, for example, knew Kenny Bernstein, American drag car driver, was called the king? Anybody know that one? Oh, I, I see a hand. Okay, awesome. Felix Hernandez, American baseball pitcher. Anybody ever heard him referred to as the king? Um, Michael Jackson, you know, king of pop. Anybody ever heard something along those lines? Okay, yeah, a few more of us. LeBron James. Anybody ever heard him referred to as the king? Okay. How about Jerry Lawler, American professional wrestler? Is he any relation? I'm just curious. The king of wrestling? Okay, I didn't see any. Um, king Levinsky. Well, you, know, you, you don't get much more closely than that. American heavyweight boxer. Um, Hen Henrik Lundqvist, uh, NHL goalie. Anybody know who that is? Okay, okay. So, and heard his name associated with the king before? All right, all right. We're going to skip down here. Arnold Palmer, American golfer. Yeah, okay. Uh, Richard Petty, American NASCAR driver, some of us probably, right? Clark Gable. Anybody remember Clark Gable being referred to as the king? I mean, I know, I know the name, right? Um, T.I., American rapper. Anybody, in, in, again, connection with the king? Yeah. How about George Strait? One last one, all right? Have you heard? Okay. All right, so, you know, and there's a lot of other ones, obviously. So a lot of people have a connection to the title, the king, Right? And even back in the Bible, there were a lot of people that had connection to that title, including Saul, Israel's first king. I don't know if you remember him. And then right after him came David, who was Israel's shepherd king. Right? God called him from tending his flock to be the king over his people. And next came his son Solomon, Israel's wisest and richest king, right? But of course, there have also been other kingly types over the years as well throughout histories. The Caesars of Rome had the power and the pomp of any great earthly king, right? Pilate, remember him in the story, he had the responsibility of a, of a lesser king without the title. And then, and then Herod in Jesus' story, he had the title of king, King Herod, you know, at the time of, of Jesus' triumphal entry. But he was really more of a governor, let's face it, okay? He wasn't really, because he, he was under Rome. He wasn't really a king. But you know what? None of these compare with the king who was knocking on the door of Jerusalem here in Matthew 21. Check it out. Verse 1 says, as they approached Jerusalem, and I'm sorry, we're going to hit the pause button already. Four words in here, but let's just pause for a second, because here in Matthew 21, again, we are reading events that happened right toward the end of Jesus' third year of ministry here on earth. Remember, Jesus had been to Jerusalem before. I mean, he was there as a baby when Joseph and Mary brought him to the temple shortly after his birth and presented him there at the temple but most recently in his story, Jesus had been in Jerusalem for the winter feast of dedication. So that was just a few months before this account happened. And from what I can tell, go, go through the Gospels, check it out for yourself. But from what I can tell, 
Every time we read in the Gospels about Jesus showing up in Jerusalem, being in Jerusalem, something significant happens and people's lives are impacted. He makes a stir. And this time was no exception. So check it out as we continue. As they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, go to the village ahead of you and at once you will find a donkey there with your colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. All right, so let's process this. Jesus and his disciples arrived at Bethphage, which was kind of like a suburb of Jerusalem, okay? I mean, it's just like right on the outskirts of Jerusalem, just a few miles outside of the big town. And while there, Jesus told two of his disciples, go into town, into the little village of Bethphage, and bring back a donkey and her colt that you're going to find tied there. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I've read this passage a number of times in my life. And, and there are some things when we read them over and over, they become kind of commonplace, right? But don't miss this. Jesus knew before he got into town that there was going to be a donkey and its colt right there, ready to go. How? I mean, if you turn back a page to Matthew 20, you'll see that Jesus and his disciples were just coming from Jericho. So they were coming from the eastern side of Judea, coming towards Jerusalem, and they arrived on the outskirts of Bethphage there. So it's not like, you know, they'd been hanging around that area. You know, and Jesus had been in and out of Bethphage and knew that there was a donkey and her colt right there. The Bible doesn't give us the specifics. I mean, I suppose it's possible that that, you know, Jesus could have sent an advanced scout, you know, go check things out and see what you find there. But but if that had been the case and Jesus knew he needed a donkey, was going to need a donkey. Don't you think it would have already been a done deal when you get to this point? I mean, it seems like, you know, if that was the case, he could have just told his disciples, hey, Peter, John, you know, go into town and get the donkey and the colt that you find tied up there and tell Bob I said hi. Right. I mean, because we, we already we already interacted. We already got this thing going on. Right. But he didn't. But Jesus knew that the donkey and colt would be there. And he knew what to tell his disciples to say if anybody asked any questions. See, even in this minor detail of the story, Jesus demonstrated his lordship and kingship over all of the earth and everything that is in it. Now listen to what the scripture says next. Verse 4, it says, This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So this event, Jesus riding into Jerusalem, it was prophesied hundreds of years earlier in the book of Zechariah. Zion was another name for Jerusalem. And in riding into town, into Jerusalem, on a donkey with its colt, Jesus was fulfilling yet another prophecy about Israel's Messiah. And how did the prophet say the king would come? Gentle and riding on a donkey. You know, a lot of people were looking for the Messiah to come as a conquering warrior. You know, a king like David, when we talked about in the weeks past. They kind of missed this prophecy somewhere along the lines in their study of the Bible, the scriptures that they had, right? When Jesus rode into town, they were still thinking, we're looking for a conquering warrior. So verse 6 continues. It says, The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt. They placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. You know, really important people, like, kings and queens, you know, they're often still honored today with a big parade, right? I mean, that tradition, you can see, goes back a really long time. Parades were a very popular way of not only welcoming that great person, but showing them honor, as we see here. Now, we read about a few of those kind of parades in the Bible, including the time when King David brought the Ark of the Covenant into Jerusalem. He set up this great parade of celebration, only it wasn't to honor King David, was it? It was honoring God in presence in Ark of the Covenant coming into town. So David threw this parade on behalf of God in that particular time. We also read about parades in our history books. 
during the time of the Roman Empire when conquering hero would return and the people would have a grand parade. It was, it was called a Roman triumph back then, okay? And in this case, the hero, Caesar or one of his great generals, they would ride into town on a chariot pulled by these magnificent war horses or in some cases even some elephants would be pulling the chariot into town. And somewhere in the mix of the parade would be his soldiers who were coming back, victors from the conquest. And somewhere in the parade would be slaves who had been captured in the midst of that battle and were coming back to serve the winning side. The hero in the Roman triumph would be given a crown of laurel leaves to wear and and a purple robe embroidered with gold to show that these people were like right next to God. Their version of God, not ours. Now, think of those parades, those triumphs. And what are some of the elements we commonly think of when we think of parades today? Let me throw a list up here really quick. We've got balloons generally in there, right? Candy, hopefully, right, that they have in there. If it's a good parade, they've got candy, right? That's how you know it's a good parade. I've got floats or wagons, animals, especially horses, people, of course, uh, music, military personnel, dancers, streamers, confetti, And, of course, the guest of honor, right? Well, guess what? As you're looking at that list of all the things that we just put up there on the screen, there's probably only one of those that wouldn't have been part of those ancient parades and the Roman triumphs. And that's probably that first one, balloons. I don't think they had, you know, the balloons, at least not the way we have them, right, these days. But everything else will most likely have been there. Now, I tell you all that to say this. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem was a lot like one of those old-fashioned parades or a Roman triumph, but it was also very different. His list of parade elements looked more like this. There were lots of people, yeah? There were animals, okay, there was one or two, donkey and a colt, all right? There were people's coats, palm branches they were waving around, and there was Jesus. I mean, if you look at that list, I mean, some might call that kind of a poor man's parade compared to the pomp and circumstance of a Roman triumph. But it was very fitting for who he was and what he'd come to do. He'd come on a donkey as a humble servant king to conquer, yes, but not to conquer people, to conquer sin. And he'd come to establish God's kingdom here on earth in the hearts of his people and then spread it throughout the world. Now, the people gathering him around in the streets of Jerusalem on that day, they didn't understand this yet. Check it out. Verse 9 says that the crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Hosanna is an interesting word. We sang it quite a number of times in the song that you heard in the cho- with the choir this morning. You know, from a, a Christian's perspective, it's a word of praise. You know, again, we think Hosanna to, to our king, right, to Jesus. But check out this quote on its origins from an article from gotquestions.org. Check it out. Quote, Hosanna is often thought of as a declaration of praise similar to hallelujah, but it is actually a plea for salvation. The Hebrew root words are found in Psalm 118.25, which says, Save us, we pray, O Lord. And the Hebrew words, yasha, deliver, save, and ana, beg, beseech, combine to form the word that in English is hosanna. So literally, hosanna means, I beg you to save, or please deliver us. So when the crowds saw Jesus riding into town on the donkey, they cheered him, yes, and at the same time, they were begging him to deliver them from the hand of Rome. But again, he hadn't come to topple the Roman Empire, to set up an earthly kingdom. But even so, Jesus' entrance to Jerusalem once again made quite a stir. Verse 10 says that when Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? And the crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. All right, so here's the thing. There were Jews from all over the region in Jerusalem at this time for the Passover celebration. And you know what? Jesus had been in many of those places 
out and about with his disciples. And he had preached there and he'd healed people there. He had touched lives there. And those people were now coming to Jerusalem for this festival, this celebration. And they were there. They were following him. Now, were they all following him for the right reasons? Mm, probably not. No, some were hoping, I'm sure, for another free lunch or to maybe catch sight of another miracle, right? Or maybe, maybe to experience a healing themselves. Um, but they probably, none of them really had in mind all of his real reasons coming into Jerusalem. His disciples didn't really get it yet. Everybody was watching to see what Jesus would do. I mean, he's coming into town now, this big parade, crowds are surrounding him. And now they're watching to see what's going to happen next, right? What comes after the triumphal entry? And, and he didn't disappoint. Check it out. What happened after the parade, verse 12 says that Jesus entered the temple courts and he drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, my house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. Don't miss the significance of this event. Jesus wasn't just throwing a little two-year-old tantrum, okay, flipping tables. Here's what was happening. The Jews were all required to pay a tribute at the temple when they came for these kind of, these kind of celebrations for the ongoing service at the sanctuary. Now, that tribute was to be paid with the Jewish half-shekel coin. And I showed you, a, you know, one of the Roman coins last week. Now, here we got a Jewish half-shekel coin that you see there. However, Jerusalem was now in the middle of the Roman Empire, right? And so the common currency in the Roman Empire was not the Jewish shekel or half-shekel. Um, it was Jewish. I mean, it was Roman money. So there were these money changers who had set up shop inside the temple courts to provide a service to the Jewish worshipers as they came from all these outskirts of places. And so they would exchange the traveler's Roman currency for the Jewish half shekel that they needed to pay the temple tax because it was absolutely no-no to give Roman currency to the Lord in this temple. Does that make sense? God said, I don't want any part of that here. So had to have the Jewish currency at the temple. But of course, these money changers... They were charging people for their service and most likely charging them more than they would have found at any other money-changing station in the city. And in the same way, the Jewish people were required to bring two doves or pigeons as a sacrifice when they came to the temple. Now, that's a bit of a hardship for somebody who's traveling from 100 miles away. You know, keep a couple birds with you that whole time, right? So, so again, there were people who took advantage of this situation and said, well, hey, we'll just provide the doves and the pigeons for you right here in the temple courts. And so people could bring their money. They could buy their doves and go on into the, you know, to the sacrifice. But again, they were charging the Jews exorbitant prices there at the temple for the sacrifice that was supposed to be a simple thing. And it was this systematic method of taking advantage of God's people in the temple and allowed by the religious leaders that infuriated Jesus, moved him to drive all the money changers out, flip over their tables and their benches and scatter the dove sellers from the temple, temple area. You know, I, as I'm picturing that whole scene, Jesus flipping the tables and driving everybody out, I, I got to imagine that some of his more aggressive disciples were thinking to themselves, yes, this is it. You know, here we go. All right, he's finally going to break out the big stuff. You know, he's going to show some of that miraculous power and just send the, the Romans and the religious leaders running. But he didn't. Instead, he went back to his ministry efforts. Check out what happens next. Verse 14 says, the blind and the lame came to him at the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. I think that says something. They saw the wonderful things he was doing, and they were upset. Wow, man, that's messed up. And they said, do you hear what these children are saying? They asked him. Yes, replied Jesus, have you never read from the lips of children and infants, you, Lord, have called forth your praise? I love it. As I said earlier, I love it when the kids are here with us as we are worshiping and praising the Lord. Because let's face it, 
they often do it better than we do. And the kids in this story, they had, they had started, no doubt, in the parade outside of the city, and they had continued that praise of our Lord right into the temple. They were right there. Kids know how to worship God with all their hearts. We would do well to take some lessons from them. And, and I'll just be honest with you. Guys, they do it, like I said, a lot of times, a lot better than we do. And of course, and when you're a kid, you get your whole body involved, don't you? Hey, I was glad to see we had our choir was waving palm branches today. We're getting into it a little bit more. That's awesome. So Jesus entered Jerusalem as the humble Messiah King. He rode into town on a donkey rather than on a chariot. And you know, there were no soldiers in his parade, at least not in his company, right? There might have been some that were kind of watching things happening, but none in his company um, because he didn't come to conquer earthly kingdoms. There were no captives in his parade because instead he came to set people free from their sins. And while he came as the humble king, we also need to remember that humble is not the same as feeble or weak. It's been said that humility is power under control. Folks, that is Jesus to a T, isn't it? Power under control. He could have at any time unleashed the full force of his power, completely changed the world, the religious and the political landscape at the time. But he didn't do that because he had something so much better in store for his true followers, for all of us, than a temporary earthly kingdom. And speaking of true followers, did you notice in this story of Jesus' entrance into Jerusalem that just like in today's world, there were several different groups in various positions of proximity to Jesus? I'm going to illustrate this with a number of circles here for a few moments. First of all, there were those who were, who were distant or indifferent. If we were playing the, the little kids game, hot and cold, you know, you're getting hot, you're getting cold. Um, these folks were cold. I mean, they were about as cold as you could get, right? Jesus was not anywhere on their radar. Either they've never heard of him, or they've only heard of him a tiny bit, and they're no interest whatsoever in getting to know any more about him. They've got their own lives to think about, and their own dreams to chase, and well, at this point, Jesus is just not in the picture at all for them. And then there were the critics or the skeptics. In Jesus' day, those were the religious leaders, right, who were more interested in their status quo than in some carpenter turned Messiah, a guy who might rock the boat with Rome and, and mess up everything that they had established. Today, though, you know, they're more often represented by the atheists and others who are still trying to eliminate the influence of Jesus in our world. And they insist that humans will be just fine all on their own without God. You know, we can take care of everything we need on our own. Unlike maybe those distant, indifferent, the, the, the folks that are uh, cold, the critics and the skeptics are often, are often a little hostile. They often go looking pick a fight with followers of Jesus, don't they? I think it's important for us to notice something about this group. Jesus didn't avoid them. He engaged with them, right? Now, it's true, he had some of his hardest words that he used reserved for the critics, but it was most likely because they were the ones with the very hardest hearts, right? Of anyone he encountered, their hearts were extremely hard. And then there is the curious, like the people of Jerusalem who, who asked a simple question, who is this guy? Who's this Jesus who's making such a stir in our town? You know, Jesus just now entered the edges of their mental radar, and they're starting to ask questions. You know, and today's day, maybe it's because they've met somebody who's a follower of Jesus. Maybe they're starting to ask questions because they met you. And, and they've seen lives changed by Jesus. And so they're starting to ask some questions. They're getting a little curious. And next is the crowd, the fans. Back in his day, these were the people who came along for the show, you know, for the free meal, for the miracles. And they were all for Jesus, right? As long as he was performing. 
And my guess is most of these had that traditional Messiah mindset, you know, that Jesus is going to be the conquering king. Guess what? There are still fans of Jesus today, aren't there? People who come for the food or the fellowship or to experience the next big thing in ministry, whether it's in the church or someplace else. But they're not really connected. They get bored easily. And then they disappear for a little while until the next big thing comes along. And then there are those who are committed. The regulars, the faithful faces in the audience. They are definitely interested in who Jesus is. And they want what he has to offer. They're taking notes and they're coming as often as they can. And finally, there are the disciples, the core around Jesus, those who are devoted to his teachings, to following him no matter what, even when they don't know for sure what it is he's up to. They don't always get it perfect, but they are consistently doing their best to act on what they have received from Jesus to this point. I'd like you to take a look at that for just a moment and consider which of those groups you most closely identify with right now. Hopefully you're not with those out there in the cold. Are you possibly a critic? It's very possible. Are you one of the curious or now a fan in the crowd? Or have you moved closer into one of those circles of the committed or even the core? As I was uh, preparing for this special service, Palm Sunday, I was reminded of a song I haven't heard or thought about in years, folks. I, I, and I, was, I wasn't sure, to be honest with you, if it would fit in this or any other service for that matter, folks. It's, seriously, it's like 40 years old, okay? Um, but I looked it up online, and I also, just so you know, I ran it by my worship director and get her feedback and input, and she gave me a half a thumbs up, I think. Um, but anyway, I looked it up online, and, and I discovered that there's, there's actually a pretty cool video that goes along with it as well. So I, I, I want to share that with you, but there are two things that you need to know before we play this video. Okay, first of all, as I already mentioned, the song was written, well, I, I didn't say exactly when, but it was written in the mid-80s, okay? So you're going to notice some 80s-sounding instruments in there, okay? But let's face it, hey, the 80s had some of the best music of all time. That's why they're still using it over and over again in things today. Um, just saying. Um, you're also, though, you're also going to hear three words repeated in Hebrew, several times throughout the course of this song. So I thought it would be good for us to have a quick little Hebrew lesson before we play the song so we can all really soak it in, okay? So the first of these three Hebrew words is Yeshua, which is Hebrew for Jesus. So everyone say Yeshua. Yeshua. Good. You're doing great. Okay, the second Hebrew word is a really short one. It's just simply ha, which is a Hebrew article for the. So everyone say ha. Only once. You only get to say it once right now. Okay, because it's not ha-ha. We're just, it's ha. Okay. All right. Now, the third Hebrew word is the toughest. It is Mashiach, which is Hebrew for Messiah. So everybody say Mashiach. Mashiach. Good. Now let's put it all together and repeat after me. Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Messiah. Jesus the Messiah. I hope what you caught in there was a new perspective on Jesus, our Messiah King. And I hope that in the days ahead, as we prepare our hearts for next Sunday's celebration of his resurrection, I hope that you will join with us as we celebrate our risen King. And I hope that God gives you a new insight, something new to add to your faith this time around the story. And that you can use that as we celebrate Jesus, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah and our King. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful for your work on our behalf. God, for your incredible sacrifice, your love for us that drove you to go to the cross on our behalf. 
and to stay there when you could have come down at any point and you could have, have taken a revenge on all of those who were opposed to you, but you didn't. You stayed there because you had a greater goal in mind, and that was to provide a way of salvation for all of us. And we thank you for that, Jesus. And we just would ask that you would uh, inspire us and challenge us in the days ahead as we continue to explore your word to show us how we can live more and more like our king, our, the humble servant king, how we can be like him, how we can craft our lives to be more and more in his image. So God, thank you again for this time. I pray that you would be with, with each one here uh, and in the upcoming week as we turn our hearts again and our minds and spirits towards the celebration of you throughout this holy week. I pray that you would come alongside each one with a special uh, a new insight into your character and also your kingdom. And all God's people said, amen. amen. You guys, thanks so much for being here. Have a wonderful day. God bless you guys. Thank you for listening. Check our webpage, countrysidefm.org, for more sermons or to get connected today.